really need to talk about capacitors. Yep, I know what you're thinking. If engineers were chefs, capacitors would be salt. Never the star of the show. You never know exactly how much you're going to need. We all just kind of sprinkle them onto our design until it tastes about right. Hmm. Nah. Needs more capacitors. But there's a lot more to choosing the best capacitor than just grabbing a shaker full of electrolytics and sprinkle them artfully around your PCB. Hmm. Pinch more there. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. It turns out that choosing the right kind of capacitor can have important implications for your design in reliability, longevity, cost, board size. My guest today is James Lewis from Kemet, and we're going to dive into some fascinating discussion of capacitors, including some super cool new organic polymer aluminum. Hmm, what's all this about? Let's find out. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about capacitors from Kemet. Hi, James. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Amelia. I'm looking forward to our discussion about a certain kind of capacitor. Okay, so my relationship with capacitors is mainly things like decoupling, of course, and working in power and filtering parts of my design. Now, I've heard of aluminum electrolytic capacitors, but what are these organic aluminum capacitors I've heard about? And and are they in that expensive section of the grocery store? <laughs> Uh, no, no, they're just a different type of aluminum electrolytic capacitor. Okay, then, why don't we talk about the difference between organic and traditional aluminum? All right, let's start by talking about what's inside of a traditional aluminum, and then we'll get to these polymer stuff in a few minutes. So if we look at this picture, I've got a can that we've kind of exploded out a little bit, and there's two key things inside the can. There's the anode foil and the cathode foil. And so these are actually the electrode plates that provide our positive and negative connection to the capacitor. In between them is a separator paper, which as you might imagine from the name, separates the two plates from each other so that we don't have direct contact. And then within those foils in that roll of paper, we have foil tabs that are connected into them, and that's what actually provides the actual terminal connection. So I notice there's no electrolyte in this electrolytic capacitor, at least on this page at least. <laughs> so where is this electrolyte hiding? <laughs> it's actually, uh, that's a good question because it's hiding inside of the paper separator. And so we actually impregnate the paper with the electrolyte itself. I think sometimes people think of kind of like this picture shows a actual liquid kind of rolling around inside the can, but it's not really like water. It's more like a paste. And so that electrolyte does a lot of things for us. One thing I wanted to point out is that there's a lot that goes into what we choose for that electrolyte. Just for example, at Kemet, we have something on the order of 40 different electrolytes electrolytes for our various products. And so we have to consider what's the pH of the material, what kind of operational temperature range does it work across, what's its ability to help us reoxidize the foil, which we'll probably talk about in a little bit. Then, of course, with all the other materials we've got going on is how compatible are they? We don't want something that eats away at the can, otherwise we have a leaky capacitor. And then, of course, we need to make sure that it doesn't cost too much to use it, it's not toxic, and more importantly, it's not flammable. Okay, James, can you walk me through how the elements of an electrolytic capacitor work together? Right. Okay, we've got the anode foil, the cathode foil, and we've got the separator, which is a red line, as we show in this diagram. Now, what we do on the anode foil is when we're processing the foil, we do two things. We acid etch it, which gives us a really large surface area. And then the second thing we do is we run it through an electrolyte bath where we actually grow the dielectric layer. And so if we think about the basic elements of a capacitor, we get our anode plate, and then we grow the dielectric, and that gives us a cathode plate. And so then over on the other side of the capacitor, we have another foil, which we call the cathode foil. And so in order to connect that foil, which is connected to the terminals, we include a conductive electrolyte between them. And so that way, we get the electrical connection to the actual cathode of the capacitor. And so that's how we get our anode plate, cathode plate, all connected. Got it. Okay, so other than making this electrical connection, how does the electrolyte do anything else for us? 
there's a really critical thing that can happen with a aluminum electrolytic capacitor and that's called reform or heal. And so remember when I talked about the electrolyte, I mentioned that we consider the pH value of the electrolyte. And that's because when the oxide is in contact with this electrolyte material, it tends to break down the oxide, which what we're showing here is a cross section of a aluminum plate where we've grown a dielectric which is the black region, and then the yellow region represents the electrolyte. And so when we grow this dielectric, we grow it based on what we call the formation voltage, which is gonna be some multiplier of the irradiant voltage, which we hope is more than your application voltage. And so the thing that happens is over time, the electrolyte will actually eat into the dielectric or the oxide, and it's gonna basically eat down to whatever voltage is applied. And so that's one reason why when we do the formation, we form it much higher than what we say we can apply to it. So even though the electrolyte can eat away at this oxide, it also has the ability to help regrow it. And so let's just say, for example, it's sitting on a shelf for a couple of years. Well, that oxide over time is going to be depleted just from the interaction between the oxide and the electrolyte. When you apply a voltage to it, however, the dielectric will actually regrow or what we call reform. And the way it does that is it pulls oxygen out of the electrolyte, allowing it to regrow the oxide. It seems like this electrolyte is a bit of a liability in a way, then if we could just get rid of this electrolyte, would it be a better capacitor? Yeah, I think the thing we need to consider is if we have like a long life application or application where conductivity is important, then we might want to consider ways to get rid of the electrolyte. And so one way we can do that is with these organic aluminum polymer capacitors. And in these capacitors, we've replaced the electrolyte with a polymer material. And so here I'm showing a cross section of a polymer aluminum capacitor. And what you might notice is the diagram doesn't look all that much different than the previous one we looked at. In fact, all we've done in this picture is just said that the polymer is now impregnated inside of the paper that separates the anode and cathodes. Okay, so then how do we get that electrical connection through the paper? Paper isn't exactly my favorite conductor. Yeah, it turns out craft paper is not so good at conducting electricity. So when we actually look inside, if we think about the a wet electrolytic, the paper was there to physically isolate the two connections. It was also there to provide a suspension for the liquid electrolyte. When we look at a polymer capacitor, some constructions use actually a film material instead of a paper material because it's only a physical separation. The polymer is a solid material. And by the way, I didn't mention this before, but if you're curious about it, it's called P-dot, P-E-D-O-T. And so it's a conductive polymer material. So is conductive polymer really an electrolyte, but without all the usual gooey mess? That's pretty close to being exactly the case. Like I said before, number one, it's a solid material. It's still there to help provide our cathode connection from the literal cathode on the dielectric to a terminal, but it's solid. It doesn't dry up in the same way that a wet electrolyte does because it's solid. It's not a liquid. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't wear out, but it has a completely different wear out mechanism. And in terms of conductivity, which is something I think you're going to be most interested in, is it can be orders of magnitude higher than a traditional electrolyte. Okay, there are always compromises. Let's get this over with. What do I give up by going with polymer electrolytic? Fantastic question, because it's very rare we can say, you know, it's actually a lot of upside and only a few downsides. And so in terms of a capacitor, generally people think, okay, when you change a material, you're going to lose some of the rate of voltage capability, or maybe the amount of capacitance that you get, or you need more size. The great thing about the polymer material is that for about the same size, we get the same voltage capacitance as available because we're only replacing out one material. The key benefit, as I mentioned, the conductivity means we get very, very low ESRs. So the one critical trade-off is that the polymer material is more temperature sensitive in terms of maximum operating temperature. And so 105, 125 are really the upper limits for the technologies, which isn't to say that 150 and maybe one day 175 isn't possible, but that's one area where we see that the operational temperature does come down a little bit compared to the same capacitance, voltage, and size for a wet electrolytic. All right, so temperature is the thing then. 
what are these temperature characteristics you're talking about? Okay, so let's say you're okay with the temperature range and you want to operate the capacitor within its temperature range, whether it's 105 or 125 or someday 150. One thing to know with just about any wet electrolyte is that you're going to see a huge shift in conductivity or probably what we're more interested in with the capacitor is a shift in resistance across its temperature range. So here, the red graph is showing us an aluminum electrolytic from negative 55 to 125 degrees C, and it shifts, it changes over 250 ohms from its cold to hot temperature. That's kind of tough to design for, right? Whereas if we look at a similar size voltage capacitance of a conductive polymer electrolytic, the same range, the shift is only 233 milliohms. And so obviously the range is much tighter but also, by the way, pay attention to the change in overall ESR. We're talking about a capacitor that is over an ohm versus one that's less than 100 milliohms. For my decoupling needs for, say, a switching power supply, how does the switching frequency affect these capacitors? Right. Sometimes a non-obvious characteristic of a capacitor, especially an electrolytic capacitor, is that the ESR is affected by frequency and it turns out it's because internally there's an RCE ladder construction that's going on and so we see the response change with frequency again because it's such a highly conductive material the overall ESR is lower and its stability is relatively high and so here we're just going to compare an aluminum electrolytic which again is much much higher ESR but it shifts quite a bit from say DC to tens of megahertz whereas if we look at the conductive polymer it's relatively stable right around 100 milliohms. It drops down a little bit around 100K, but it's mostly stable across the frequency suite. And then back on temperature a little bit. How does temperature translate into life expectancy? This is probably one of the most misunderstood and critical differences between a wet electrolyte and a conductive polymer electrolytic. The lifetime of a conductive polymer is significantly better than a traditional aluminum electrolytic. One of the main reasons why is that as the aluminum electrolytic is used over a period of time, its electrolyte dries up. And so that affects its lifetime. Now, if we look at this graph, a common rule of thumb is that for every 10 degree decrease, you'll double the life of an aluminum electrolytic, which is typically true for a standard wet electrolyte. However, if we look at the conductive polymer, life is 10 times longer with every 20 degree decrease. And so it's not a linear relationship between their lifetimes. Now the way you can kind of think about this is look at these lower temperatures, right? Under 85 degrees C, you're getting significantly more life out of that conductive polymer. Now, like I said, the one kind of trade-off here is that as you get closer to 105, 125, that's not quite the same advantage, but you still do get the benefit of lower ESR. And since temperature isn't a big factor in the life of my capacitor, what about self-heating and internal resistance? Good follow-up because if we think about temperature, it's easy to think about ambient, but most of the time we're worried about what does the self-heating do to the capacitor within an ambient situation. And so because the ESR is so low on these parts, they can take on higher amounts of ripple current before their self-heating contributes to the overall maximum temperature. And so we've tried to normalize out some information here. So this graph, we're going to look at aluminum electrolytic versus conductive polymer. And we're looking at the same voltage and capacitance and when possible, the same case sizes. And so what's interesting is when you look at this, you've got quite a bit more ripple current available from the conductive polymer. And so basically, we've done the math for you. We've looked at what the self-heating would be, and then we added it to a room temperature ambient to get to 105C. So if you're not calculating with room temperature, then we have to do a little bit different math, but the same trend holds. The conductive polymers can handle quite a bit more ripple current than a traditional aluminum electrolytic, which by the way, might mean you don't need as much capacitance, or really where I'm getting is you don't need as many capacitors. And so you might actually be able to reduce the size of your design just with a single polymer capacitor. Okay, I think I've got a pretty good handle on all of this. Uh, hit me with some of that data sheet stuff. Okay, let's, let's look at some things that maybe don't look so good on a graph, but I think they're important to understand about the aluminum polymers. So first of all, they do have a shelf life, but it's not really much different than any other surface mount capacitor. The shelf life is really related to 
the solderability of the component, not necessarily the degradation of the capacitive element. Now, the one exception here is that aluminum polymer capacitors, and we see this with almost any capacitor using PDOT, is going to be rated as an MSL1 rating. In terms of surge voltage, there are similar surge capabilities to a traditional aluminum electrolytic, but it's going to be series dependent, so you're going to have to look at the parts data sheet to understand what its surge capabilities are. In terms of derating, voltage derating, even temperature derating to some extent, it's not like other polymer capacitor technologies where you're told you need a 10 to 20% voltage derate. You can use 100% of the applied voltage to the capacitor. Obviously, the less voltage you apply, you'll probably increase the life, but it's not going to have a significant effect on the wear out, unlike traditional wet electrolytics. And then finally, the failure mode, sort of like aluminum electrolytic, the ESR will change over time. The mechanism for that ESR change is different, but what we'll see is that the ESR will increase, which will effectively turn it into an open as it reaches end of life. Okay, James, remind me again how traditional electrolytic and polymer are similar and different. Okay, so they're similar in their form factors. Um, radial lead it, surface mount, snap in, all available in the same sort of packages you're used to. Quite honestly, the big difference you'll notice is the colors that we use on the silk screen are different. You'll see very similar voltages and capacitances between the two. Now for the highest voltage parts, it's still going to be done with a wet electrolytic, but we keep seeing the voltages on the polymers go up higher and higher. And just for context, I'm talking about things like in the 300, 400 volt range. If we're talking anything 50 volts and below, nearly identical. And then in terms of price, of course, my favorite answer with capacitors is price is always it depends on a number of factors. But when we look at the differences between these two, we typically see things that are in the same ballpark. And then of course, keep in mind, with lower ESR, you get more effective capacitance at switching frequencies. And so in a switching application, you may actually be able to use fewer components, which will contribute to a lower overall cost. And polymer is better at what? Number one message, if you didn't hear it before, is that there is so much less ESR with these parts. And so if you can't relate how that could be helpful in your circuit, just remember, Less ESR means less heat, and almost everybody wants less heat in their designs. Basically, it allows us to address more ripple current with these devices. Because there is no liquid electrolyte, there is a much longer lifetime associated with them. Now, there are wear out mechanisms associated with polymer, and field application engineer can talk to you about what that's going to be, but the mechanism is completely different. And then lastly, as we saw, especially with temperature, the parameters for the capacitor are extremely stable. We're getting much closer to a solid device, which isn't a surprise. They are solid devices. And so it just makes it much easier to design in with these parts because the range of change is much lower. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, James. Oh, you're very welcome, Amelia. I think aluminum capacitors are very popular, and I think it's really important to understand the difference between these two types. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out more information about capacitors from Kemet. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out the Chalk Talks section of eejournal.com or head on over to YouTube, keyword eejournal. 